Hello ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk about the first in a three-part series on plants. There will also be a three-part series on the animal kingdom. So let's do an overview of the plant kingdom. All plants are multicellular, eukaryotic, and they have cells that have cell walls that contain cellulose. And all plants are also autotrophs. Originally, all the land plants came from phytoplankton, specifically green algae, which is Divi division chlorophyta of kingdom protista. We know this because chlorophytes use the same types of chlorophyll, chlorophytes store their excess carbohydrates as starch, and chlorophytes have cellulose in their cell walls, all of these things that our plants do too. Plants first moved on land during the Devonian period, which is known as the age of fishes, but it's also the age in which organisms started moving on land, including arthropods and plants. When they moved onto, plant, onto land, they had to find several ways to combat the problems found with terrestrial life. They had to deal with drying out, how to make food, reproduction, dealing with gravity because they no longer have water buoying them up, and also moving nutrients and water around their bodies. When plants started dealing with drying out, they developed a waxy cuticle and stomata that helped to open and close to regulate transpiration. We'll talk about that more in the next lecture. For making food, land plants started to form leaves, which are broad surfaces to increase the surface area for more photosynthesis to take place. For reproduction, plants developed alternation of generations, which means that they form specialized structures for sexual or asexual reproduction. Dealing with gravity was particularly difficult for plants, and so they developed roots to hold in, in them in place, a cork layer, which is also known as bark, to hold the stem more rigidly, and they developed methods by which hydrostatic pressure can be used to hold up their stems. Finally, for nutrient and water transport, they developed into two types, avascular plants and vascular plants. Avascular plants transport um, water and nutrients through diffusion or osmosis, so it's relatively slow. Vascular plants developed vessels to transport these nutrients and waters. All avascular plants are known as the bryophytes, and vascular plants are known as the tracheophytes. There are three bryophyte groups, the mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. All are small, less than two inches tall. They have no vessels, and they grow in clumps in moist environments. Bryophytes are particularly important um, in several different industries, and peat moss is one of the most important. Peat moss is used in agriculture, the floral industry, and also as a fuel source. When digging those fuel sources, however, sometimes we find um, some interesting things like this guy. With this guy, he was found, he's considered, he's what's called a bog mummy or a bog person. And he was found outside the town of Clonakaven in Ireland. When they looked at him, they couldn't tell whether it was a current... Um, murder victim or if it was somebody who had died much longer ago until they did some research. After they did some research they realized that he was an Iron Age man and he that means he lived somewhere within about 500 years before or after the birth of Christ. This particular man had a, a very rough ending. His head was bashed in and then flattened by the weight of the peat. Um, his neck was sharply turned to the right uh, to the left he had been strangled his belly had been cut open with a knife um, his nose had been broken his skull had been shattered and um, yeah he just had a kind of a bad day but it was pretty much a ritual they're pretty sure it was a ritual um, killing the interesting thing though is that Pete when it's in a bog, it produces an antimicrobial uh, environment, and it's also an oxygen-free environment. So that means that they are perfectly preserved, and it kind of tans their skin into this leather-like substance that you see here. 
It also dyes all of their hair orange red, in case you care. Reproduction in bryophytes can happen both sexually and asexually. However, um, the liverworts, unlike the mosses and the hornworts, only can reproduce asexually, vegetatively. For sexually uh, reproduction, they produce an antheridium and an archegonium. The antheridium produces the sperm, which is the male gametophyte plant, and the archegonium produces eggs, which are the female gametophyte plant. So that means that um, they actually need a water medium to swim the sperm to the eggs, and that's why you find them in moist environments. If they reproduce asexually, they reproduce um, in two ways, by fragmentation and by producing gemmules. Fragmentation means that they break apart and start a new plant. But a widespread mean of, means of asexual reproduction in both liverworts and mosses is the production of gemmules or gemmi. These are multicellular bodies that can give rise to new plants. The tracheophytes, remember these are the ones that have vessels, come in these five big groups, club mosses, horsetails, ferns, naked seeded plants, and the flowering plants, or in order, Lycophyta, Sphenophyta, Pteraphyta, Gymnosperms, and Angiosperms. I will let you know that this is also the order in which they showed up in the fossil record, so probably they go from less complex to more complex lifestyles. All tracheophytes have these two types of vessels. The xylem transports water and dissolved minerals from the roots to the rest of the plant. It's important that you know these, so make sure that you write this down. The xylem transports water and dissolved minerals up from the roots. The phloem transports dissolved sugars from photosynthesis from the leaves to the rest of the plant. The club mosses were the first of the tracheophytes, and they are small vascular plants. They have two types, and that's the strobilus and the prothallus. Strobilus are leaves that produce the spores, so they are asexual. The prothallus are leaves that produce the gametophyte plant, so either the antheridium or the archegonium, very similar to the way it works in mosses. The horsetails we find all over Idaho, especially southeastern Idaho, anywhere you have a low-lying area with abundant water and they are a very ancient type of plant. They were there before the dinosaurs. You can always recognize them by their jointed stems. They're, they can get quite tall. And the interesting thing is, is that the jointed stems are almost like straws within straws, and you can actually breathe through them if you take off the tops. Their reproduction is similar to that of the club mosses. The ferns first appeared in the fossil record about 400 million years ago. This is the first group in which the sporophyte is the dominant plant in the alternation of generations. So it's where ferns began that it started to split to a, do a sporophyte dominant rather than a gametophyte dominant plant. And all of the rest of the groups are sporophyte dominant. It has been a very successful life uh, cycle. So you find ferns in warm, moist environment, and they can get quite large. In fact, there's some in Australia called tree ferns that are literally the size of trees. And um, most of the fossil fuels that we burn, for example, petroleum, comes from tr compacted tree ferns that happened during the Carboniferous period. They have a great deal of economic importance. They're used in the floral industry, decorative gardening, and also for salads, we can eat these, especially the fiddleheads, which are the baby ferns. They look like the end of a fiddle. And make sure that in your book you go over the anatomy of a fern, because you do need to know the different parts. The gymnosperms means naked seeds, and these were the first group to make seeds. They produce the seeds in a cone, and they do not produce flowers or fruit. All gymnosperms are wind-pollinated, which means that if you live where there's a large concentration of gymnosperms, usually conifers, uh, in the spring you notice that the sidewalks, the roads, your car, your windows turn like yellow-green, and that's because they are spreading their pollen all over the place, and this is the first group that had pollen instead of spores. 
the sperm inside that pollen fertilizes the egg to produce a zygote. The zygote will develop into the embryo, and embryos are fed by the cotyledons, the first leaves. Now, a point of note, the large cones that you see on a, on a pine tree or a fir or whatever, those are the female cones. The male cones are very small, usually at the tips of the branches, and you can see a picture of them in the upper right-hand corner on this slide. So seeds are incredibly energetically expensive for the plant to produce. So why would they bother? Well, the first thing is that seeds protect the embryos from drying out. So that means that these plants can live much farther away from open sources of water than other types of plants that came before them could. Additionally, seeds have a built-in food supply. So there's some seeds that have literally been germinated after 5,000 years. They find them in archaeological sites and they said, hey, what would happen if we put it in dirt? Well, guess what? It germinated. So, so sometimes those seeds can be, have plenty of food to survive for long, long periods of time. And some seeds are also designed for travel. So, for example, um, there's seeds of the giant sea bean and they fall into waterways and they travel to other uh, islands in the Pacific and they form new palm trees or new sea bean trees. Uh, some seeds are designed to be eaten. For example, like coffee cherries are designed to be eaten. Some seeds have wings on them and that helps them to fly farther away from the parent plant so that they're more likely to germinate in a non-shaded area. Gymnosperms are a fairly large group, um, but they're not as large as the angiosperms. They come in a lot of different um, types of plant configurations. They're not all like pine trees, as you can see here. Um, the one on the left is a cycad, and cycads are very ancient. They're also con considered dinosaur plants. Um, they're very ancient lineage and they live in tropical areas. The one on the right is ginkgo. There is only one species left of that plant here on the planet, and so um, this is one of the few that actually comes in a male plant or a female plant. They don't exist as male and female on the same tree. Um, and by the way, if you ever plan on growing a ginkgo, make sure you grow the male because the females stink like sweaty socks that have been stuck in a footlocker for six months. It's pretty pretty foul. Okay, but the largest group are the conifers, and that's why when I say gymnosperms, people typically think of pine trees and their relatives, because there's over 25,000 species of conifers. Most of them have needles or scale-like leaves, and that helps them to prevent water loss and go dormant during the winter time, and most of them have woody cones and are evergreens. Now I'm going to talk about wood next time as well, but wood, as we know, is a very economically important product of plants. And wood is made of the thick-walled vessels called tracheids. And tracheids are what transport, it contains the xylem tissue. So this is, it conducts water and minerals up and down, and it also pr provides support. Gymnosperms can be used in building materials or as landscaping or for erosion control. And if the wood comes from a gymnosperm, it's considered a softwood, regardless of how hard it actually is. If it comes from an angiosperm, like an oak tree, it's considered a hardwood, even though some softwoods are harder than some hardwoods, and some hardwoods are softer than some softwoods. The final group, and the most complex group, is the angiosperms, or vessel seeds because all of them have seeds enclosed in fruits. All of them produce flowers, and all of them uh, have can either be wind or animal pollinated. Some are very specific. Even though you don't necessarily see the flowers, if it's an angiosperm, it does produce them, but sometimes they can be very, very small, especially if they're wind pollinated. There are two basic types of angiosperms, the monocots and the dicots. 
Monocots have about 60,000 species, and most of our cereal, cereal crops, our base staple crops, are monocots. Corn, rice, uh, wheat, barley, rye, etc. Those are all monocots. Dicots have about 170,000 species. And so most of our vegetable plants are dicots. So that's kind of how you can keep them in mind. But one thing I would like you to do is to go ahead and copy down the key points from your whatever your book, whichever book you have. It has a chart comparing monocots and dicots, and you do need to know some of the differences between them. For example, the leaf venation is vitally important that you know that. The number of cotyledons, you need to know that, and also you need to know um, the flower petal arrangement. There's more than that, but you do need to know those. Finally, angiosperms have different lifespans, and they're classified by their lifespans in addition to a lot of other things. But I'm going to go over the basics. If you garden, you already know these things, but if you don't, um, then I'm going to go over them anyway. The annuals have a lifespan of one year or less. That means they, they sprout from seed, they reproduce, and they die all in the same season. Most of these are herbaceous. They don't bother putting up a bark layer because they're not going to be around for a year, more than a year. And most of our crop plants are annuals. Things like wheat, corn, barley, rye, tomatoes, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, all of that. Those are all annuals. Biennials have a two-year lifespan. And some wildflowers here in Idaho are biennials. Finally, perennials live for several years. They're often larger, and they often have a woody layer. Okay, so we're going to go into the specifics of plant structures in the next one. So make sure that you've reviewed this material. You do need to know examples of, you know, a, an organism that fits in each of these categories for the different plants, and make sure that you review monocots and dicots and the structure of ferns. If you have any questions, see me during office hours and have a great day.